Amnesia is a relatively common trope in cinema. For example, in the movie Memento by Christopher Nolan, the main character Leonard is searching for a man who has presumably killed his wife before his eyes, but of whom he has absolutely no memories at all, since he has become completely unable to remember anything of the event and since. In Mulholland Drive, one of the main characters, Rita, is trying to remember who she is and what she might have done to end up where she is. Both Hollywood films center their plots around the loss of memory. But amnesia can also sometimes serve as an incidental dimension of a character, as the Joker, where the main character has completely forgotten about the dreadful relationship he used to have with his mother, so as to keep the pain away. Based on all these Hollywood films, you would think amnesia is a rather common condition. But is it in real life? Let us look at what specialists say about amnesia. It seems only 25 in 100,000 people are concerned by amnesia, the majority of them being over 50 years old. These individuals suffer a partial or complete loss of memory caused by lesions in the brain or, more rarely, by psychological protection reflexes designed to protect them from post-traumatic stress. We realize that the contrast between the frequency of actual amnesia in real life and in movie is stark. What is so compelling about amnesia then? Why have filmmakers taken such a strong interest in it, to the point that it has become a recurring theme in cinema? To delve further into the reasons for using amnesia, let us first examine how movie directors proceed to convey it. Indeed, there are several distinct techniques to show their story has traveled through time, that certain events are memories and that the memories have in addition been repressed and therefore elude the characters. Some of these techniques are narrative, others specifically visual. The easiest way to describe what is going on to the spectators is of course to have the characters themselves explain the situation. Look, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. It's nothing personal. We understand in this scene that Leonard suffers from amnesia. But a couple of minutes later, Nolan uses a more implicit technique, which immediately signals to us the scenes we are watching must have happened earlier, since they lead up to that scene. Natalie. And you don't remember me. Here, there is no need for any character to explain anything to the spectators to understand they are watching a scene that took place earlier in the past. In Arrival, the main character is introduced to us as living alone in large house. A little while later, we discover her with a little girl who we the spectators imagine to be her daughter. That little girl is lying in a bed and looks very ill. These elements lead us to believe this scene took place in the past, that it is a remembrance and that her daughter has since passed away, explaining why she is no longer around. The fact that the mother keeps having visions of her daughter over and over only goes to show how traumatic her disappearance has been. Yet, at some point, she reveals that she doesn't know who that girl is. This immediately leads the spectator to conclude that the trauma has been so intense she has forgotten, repressed the very memory of her existence. This shows how much a few images placed strategically can convey. It is a more elegant technique than the more belabored verbal explanation. Nolan has exploited this smart technique to a fault in Memento, since the entire movie revolves around the reverse narrative, each scene describing how the character arrived where he is in the scene before except for a few events which happen in a chronological order, otherwise it would be too straightforward. Also, it turns out the girl wasn't really her daughter in Arrival, or not yet at least. These images were not memories she had forgotten about, but visions of the future. But the majority will have believed them to be past memories. This shows how used we have become to that old amnesic trick. 
conveying that what we are seeing on screen is memories rather than a present reality can also be done through special visual techniques. Let us take the scenes in Arrival where the main character's daughter appears. They feature distinct visual characteristics which set them apart from the rest. The colors are warmer or the background is blurry for instance. They are also usually very short and we can sometimes hear the muffled sound of the child laughing or babbling away in the background. The switch from these scenes back to the present time is usually signaled by a sudden gasp. Another common element signaling that we were in the mind of the character. Similar visual effects are also used in Memento when learning things about his deceased wife. Nolan also uses yet another well-established visual technique to pinpoint flashbacks. He switches to black and white. In that particular case, the black and white is meant to separate the events which happen chronologically from the other sequences which we discover in reverse chronological order. I have no reason to make it work. Me? Yeah. I got a reason. Through these different techniques, spectators are provided bearings and a fair chance at understanding a confusing situation. The characters, rather than the spectator, are the lost ones. They have little or no access to crucial elements of the past, which we, spectators, are provided glimpses of, that usually have us wondering, like the characters themselves, what the hell happened? And it turns out, most of the time, that the amnesia is explained by a traumatic event, Rita's car accidents at the beginning of the movie, the Joker's painful childhood, or the supposed death of one's daughter in Arrival, for example. But this original trauma isn't actually central to the plot. It is often indeed brushed aside, mentioned very briefly as an addendum or not mentioned at all. This means that what drives filmmakers to feature amnesic people again and again is something other than just an interest in the condition itself. Now that we have examined some of the techniques used to convey amnesia, let us turn to why so many films feature amnesiacs. The first and most obvious reason why filmmakers like amnesiacs is that they are a fantastic means for them to have fun experimenting with their own medium. This is obviously the case in Memento. The whole movie is a massive puzzle. Both the spectators and the main characters are trying to find who the killer of Leonard's wife is, and every time a new clue is provided, a new element comes up that casts doubt on a favored hypothesis. This thrilling sense of suspense is, probably, one of the main assets of amnesiacs for filmmakers. They keep the film's intensity high and allow for all kinds of amazing and dramatic twists, like the spectacular one that ends a rival. As we started to explain before, what we thought were flashbacks turn out to be flash forwards. As regards Milholland Drive, the main character turns out to be Betty, Rita's new ingenue friend, and not Rita, the amnesiac herself. Betty is actually named Diane in real life, and she has had Rita killed out of jealousy and envy. She herself is what is commonly called a failure. And the majority of the movie was in all likelihood just a dream in which she lived her fantasized life. In a sense, she is amnesic too, since while she is dreaming, she has no recollection of who she really is, and we, spectators, have no clue. This shows how powerful amnesia can be. Not only does it make us wonder about Rita's past, but it is also so misleading we don't realize who the ultimate manipulator is. Anyhow, the suspense generated by the unknown factor can be emphasized to the point of creating a horror-like atmosphere. A great example in Mulholland Drive once again is when Rita and Diane inspect an empty house which Rita feels she knows and might be her own until they discover a rotting corpse on the bed. The fact that this place might be related to the traumatic event which caused Rita's amnesia and the dark and mysterious ambient music make the scene all the more spine-cheating. 
we subsequently discovered that this corpse is probably Diane's rather than Rita's, as Diane committed suicide in that very place. This dream would then be her final adieu and trip to her final dying self in the form of a wish-fulfilling fantasy. As a conclusion to this section, it should be said that amnesia is quite commonly used in video games too, specifically horror games. The character is then stuck in a weird place, not knowing how he or she got there nor how to escape it. It is usually a good way to introduce the character and the mechanics of the game. The player learns how to move around and investigate at the same time as the character. I don't know who I am. The techniques we have explored represent but a few of the more obvious appeals of amnesia for filmmakers. There are others, perhaps more profound appeals still. Indeed, amnesia also makes it easier for spectators to identify and empathize with the amnesia character and his emotions since both are discovering key elements, including about themselves, at the same time. In Memento, we feel the confusion of the main character when he finds out the terrible truth about himself. That's right. The real John G. I helped you find him over a year ago. He's already dead. Namely, the fact he had already found his wife's killer a while ago, and that he is still looking for the murderer simply because he chose to forget. We found him, you killed him. But you didn't remember. So I helped you start looking again. He chose to forget because he had no future once it was over. It was a way for him to always have an objective, a way to make up for the void inside him, like the one we may feel at the end of an especially powerful movie. Another example of such an identification to the main character is in The Joker. When The Joker finds out the truth about his mother, she abused him his whole childhood through and yet acts caringly now that she is old and needs support. We went over this, Penny. You adopted him. We have all the paperwork right here. That's not true. Thomas had that all made up. So it stayed our secret. You also stood by one of your boyfriends repeatedly abused your adopted son and battered you. We understand the feeling he has of being betrayed because we were too, in a way, since we were misled about the mother. Amnesia thus makes the whole well-known identification process even more intense than it already is in cinema. Finally, filmmakers use their movies as an opportunity to question several commonly held preconceptions. In particular, amnesia allows movie directors to explore philosophical questions about identity and their perception of reality. Indeed, amnesia allows them to explore how it feels when reality, or what commonly passes as such, becomes shifty, blurry, unreliable. Both in Arrival and Memento, the main characters cannot trust their memory, since it has become faulty. Your notes could be unreliable. Memory's unreliable. Ah, oh, please. No, 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 really. No, Memory's I... not perfect. It's not even that good. Ask the police. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable. That's... The cops don't catch a killer by sitting around remembering stuff. Right. They, they collect know. facts. That's not what I'm they make notes and they draw conclusions. Facts, not memories. Thus, Leonard has come up with a method to be completely sure what he believes is true. He never trusts what people advise him to do and what they tell him they know. Leonard only trusts the facts he has seen with his own eyes and quickly writes them down or tattoos them on his skin so that he never forgets, since he will probably forget about them a few minutes afterwards if he doesn't. However, the ending of the movie reveals this method is faulty too, since he has fooled himself with fake facts so as to carry on his chase forever and find a new killer each time. Moreover, mischievous people have been taking advantage of his condition and have successfully misled him so that he kills people for them. At this point, Leonard has absolutely no way of knowing what is true or not, except what he is living at the present time. But are we really that different from Leonard? Is the only reliable reality we have access to the one perceived through our senses? Some philosophers believe that the only reliable truth is the knowledge that we exist, but this is perhaps overkill. Another possible questioning is the following. Who are we without our memories? 
even if our memories are not reliable, we can still identify with them, since they usually characterize how we think and react to our outside world. Denis Villeneuve's Blade Runner shatters this conception by introducing replicants, humanoid robots which have had memories planted in their brains so as to make them more human-like. One could say they have been given an identity. However, one replicant, named Kay, has vivid childhood memories of places which truly exist. He discovers that a real boy has actually lived those memories, so he wonders if he is a special replicant who had a real childhood. At the end of the movie, he finds out that this boy did exist, but it wasn't him. Those real memories were planted in his brain, which was illegal because only fake memories are supposed to have been used. Thus, Kay understands that all he thought he knew about himself was wrong. These memories are someone else's and he does not really exist. In the original Blade Runner by Ridley Scott, the question is whether we can determine if an individual is a replicant or a human. Also, a scientific theory once suggested that we all live in a simulation and that all our memories could have been implanted in our brains and that our world only started a few seconds ago. Thus, we've seen how powerful a tool amnesia can be for filmmakers. Through various narrative and visual techniques, they have used this trope to indulge in a fantastic story full of suspense emotions and philosophical questionings. Our initial question was why there is such a contrast in the frequency of amnesiacs in real life and in Hollywood movies. We now understand why filmmakers use it so much, but is it really as rare as scientists claim in real life? As far as amnesia caused by lesions in the brains, yes indeed. However, the testimonies of rape victims that keep cropping up through the Me Too movements beg us to question our assumption that such a defense mechanism is as rare as we originally thought. These individuals have not literally lost their memory, but they have repressed their memories of the violence they endured, and the Me Too movement has acted as the reawakening of the dormant or latent pain, curing them and us all perhaps of our amnesia.